Welcome to the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. As Paul Robeson once said that each generation defines its own history and will be defined at this moment by the history that we make and the way that we take the crisis that we have, a crisis that tests us all, but it also provides us with strength. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. We stand at the threshold of a historic opportunity in the human experiment to reimagine how to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. It's a revolution from the heart of nature and the human heart. In this series, The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, we celebrate social and scientific innovators with breakthrough solutions for restoring people and planet, creating a future environment of hope. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Those famous words of Sir Isaac Newton remind us that the future is really about memory. We all arrive from somewhere with a long and winding history, a lineage of ancestors. We're becoming ancestors for generations to come. Yet today, in many communities and regions of the world, it's hard to see further, literally, because of the air pollution. It can be even harder to escape from the burdens of history, generational poverty, racism, oppression, environmental degradation. So how do we honor our responsibility to those who came before and those yet to come? In a word, resilience. Create the conditions in which future generations can flourish. In this half hour, actor and activist Danny Glover and changemaker Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, former CEO of Green for All, show how one sure path to resilience is to build community and social movements, which requires learning how to reach out across our differences. This is real change. The political gets personal. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. When I was born, there was an enormous opportunity to see and begin to reimagine the world in a different way, to begin to shape my own life and own values about what I actually saw. Danny Glover is world-renowned as an actor, producer, and director. Yet he ought to be equally recognized for his lifelong courage in the enduring quest for justice, democracy, and freedom. He was born and raised in San Francisco. His parents, postal workers, were active in the NAACP, dedicated to advancing equal rights. Danny stood on their shoulders. At San Francisco State University in the 60s, he was a member of the Black Student Union and helped lead a student strike. That led to the creation of the first Black Studies Department and first School of Ethnic Studies in the United States. Over the decades, Danny Glover has been at the visionary forefront of the struggles for social and racial justice, unions and worker rights, farm worker rights, the anti-apartheid movement, ending the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and economic justice with Occupy Wall Street. He has never forgotten where he came from. Danny Glover spoke at a Bioneers conference. I had the extraordinary advantage of also being able to have a part of my life spent in the rural South with my grandparents. My grandparents were born respectively in 1892 and 1895, so very little had changed from the South inherited after the end of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation and Reconstruction at the point they were born. My great-grandmother, my maternal grandfather's mother, happened to hold me she was born in 1853 and freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. So there's a great deal of memory that resides in this 67-year-old body, whether that's part of my historic memory, part of my psychic memory. But I had the opportunity to be in those places. And if you can, in some sense, 
marry the two experiences, the Deep South and the Haight-Ashbury, you have something real interesting there. <laughs> Ozzie Davis once said to me, just weeks before his transition, he said, we need artists to save us from machines. He went further than just those who announced themselves as artists, but as the old Tao saying is, may we live our lives artistically. So all of us encompass this whole spirit of ourselves as artists. So the idea that we need to, we need to use those capacities of our imagination and memory, memories that allowed you to make the transition as human beings from one stage of development to the next stage of development, and I use the word development, not growth, but development in that sense. Memory is essential to that process. Let's check out all, throw out all the lethal weapons and all the movies that people know me by. The great gratification in my life and great experiment in my life is the engagement that I've been able to establish and benefited from as I watch movements develop for the last more than 40 years. In 1967, Danny Glover encountered a document that changed his life. The Arusha Declaration was a revolutionary statement in which Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere outlined his country's commitment to self-reliance based on the concept of Ujama. Ujama means extended family or familyhood, where a person becomes a person through the people and community. Danny Glover has a long engagement with union activism. In 2011, he received the United Auto Workers Social Justice Award. I've been working with auto workers in Canton, Mississippi, Nissan auto workers who simply want to organize a union. Can you believe it that in this country right here that they don't have union representation in Canton, Mississippi? or in Nashville, Tennessee, where primarily the auto workers in Canton, Mississippi are African American, 80%. Primarily the auto workers in Nashville, Tennessee are white workers, 70 to 80%. Neither one of them have unions. Now the idea of that is profound. Nissan, who's been there 10 years, has not allowed them to vote to have a union. Well, I happened to go on a delegation with them, first to South Africa, and they met members of a union, strong union, a union that had been involved and engaged in the anti-apartheid movement, NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers. They're the ones that negotiate, and they saw something that they thought was unbelievable, that they themselves had never experienced in Canton, Mississippi. And we know Mississippi is. Mississippi is Megar Evers. Mississippi is the three civil rights workers. Mississippi is all that we know. Things that they were capable a building and relationships that they were able to build with these union workers in South Africa, building solidarity. And not only talk about their own plight, but talk about labor and from the global vantage point and what is happening to labor there. That experience transformed them. So I've had the opportunity watching the transformation of these human beings, seeing them empower themselves, these workers, seeing them now have larger expectations and demands on themselves, yes, but also on those who dictate what happens in their lives as well. So they not only become better union workers, better workers, but they become better citizens as well. As Danny Glover points out, building relationships is what builds movements. In Baltimore, one group that captured Glover's imagination was the Baltimore Urban Debate League, founded in 1999 as part of a national initiative to transform public education by bringing debating skills back to the urban classroom. And I happened to meet a group of young debaters, young African-American men, and they won the National Debate Championship and teach others to debate social policy to debate social, using debate as a platform to debate social policy. So one of the things that they were able to do in that quest was to stop the building of a juvenile detention center in Maryland. They played a campaign and won and stopped the building of that. They're also using that to see how they can themselves not only train others, but use access, the access that they have now the knowledge that they've learned, the memory that they've collected, 
not only the memory of their own struggle and their own transition, but the memory also that's created by those who come before them. And they use that now, and they find ways in which they can engage politically and to change the dynamics around Baltimore. They're having town hall meetings that seats about 200, where they discuss local issues from whether it's poverty, or whether it's education, or whether it's homelessness, all of those are housed within this creative space. And it's another way of finding ways in which we can translate and reimagine our relationship to those things that are vital to us, our relationship to democracy, our relationship to nature as well. I said all this because I think sometimes we find ourselves detached from the real things that are happening that change our lives. As King once said in his last book, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Where do we go from here? And what do these movements that we see spring up, how do they now translate into the world that we envision? How do they now translate into the people who we desire to be? And it's important. We know that this system, the dominant culture, what it's done is done irreparable damage to nature. It's done irreparable damage to us, in a sense. It's in some sense alienated us from nature, alienated us from ourselves, and alienated us from the ideas of community as well. We could talk about, on the one hand, poverty, and have all the knowledge that we want in terms of understanding poverty, but do we know what it is? Do we have empathy for that? We have a lot of knowledge, but we often don't have a lot of understanding. There's a difference between knowledge and understanding. You know, understanding is having empathy, understanding the plight. When we return, Phaedra Ellis Lamkin says the political has to get personal, and Danny Glover invites us to reimagine everything. This is Real Change, The Political Gets Personal. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. To explore more Bioneers radio shows and video programming, please visit Bioneers.org. Danny Glover asks, how do movements actually manifest the world we want and who we want to be? It requires understanding, and understanding requires empathy. For Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, reaching out across differences became imperative, both personally and professionally. As chief executive officer of Green for All until 2013, she led the respected nonprofit organization to become one of the country's leading advocates for a clean energy economy and most important voices for economic justice. Then, she became a mother, and that changed everything. Phaedra Ellis Lampkins. You know, what's interesting about being a mother is it changes the way you think about change and time. All of my life I've been working for social change, but I really worked for social change during my lifetime. And what being a mom has meant is now I think about social change in her lifetime, not my lifetime. And that's been a really significant thing. And so today is really a love letter to my daughter. And the reason I wanna talk about myself is because what you become clear about is that real change is not policy, laws, and government. Real change is how we relate to one another. And to have real change, you have to know who I am. And so I have to learn to talk about who I am. But I will say it's so much easier to talk about what you want than who you are. So bear with me. My name is Phaedra Ellis Lampkins. I grew up in a small town called Sassoon, which you probably may have heard of because you're actually from California. And I grew up with a mom who was very kind, but a dad who wasn't. And my dad was very violent, and there was a lot of drugs and physical abuse in our house. And what that meant is I carried a lot of shame with me. And I knew that 
what was happening in our home wasn't happening in everyone else's home, but I knew I wasn't supposed to talk about it. We didn't have a lot of money, and I knew that was bad. I remember when I was young, I was going into a grocery store and I was paying for pickles with food stamps. And this woman looked at me as though I was crazy and she started talking about the woman next to her about me and how that's what poor people did is they used those food stamps to buy snacks. And what she didn't understand is I hadn't had a sandwich with meat in it before. We had pickle and cheese sandwiches for lunch because you got free cheese and you got pickles. But what I walked out of that grocery store feeling was that I wasn't okay, that I was less than, and that I knew I had done something bad. And so when you carry with you the very physical feeling of poverty, when you know you have shame and fear, you know something's wrong with you, you sometimes aren't able to talk about what's going on. Phaedra Ellis Lampkin's experience growing up led her to enter the labor movement. She headed both the South Bay AFL-CIO Labor Council and Working Partnerships USA. And she soon found that reaching out across differences got really complicated really fast. The first time I met with the environmental movement, it was in our local community. Within 30 miles, there's Chevron, Anheuser-Busch, CNH Sugar, Sheldon Oil was within two houses of where I grew up. And what was interesting is, if you're poor, how do you get to be better? How do you think people think you get to be better? You stop being poor. <laughs> it's very simple here in America. And how do you stop being poor if you're poor? You get a job in a place that probably has a pretty bad environment. And so all of the folks that I know that worked in factories that paid middle class wages worked in places that polluted the environment. And so the first time I met an environmentalist, they were coming into our community and they were saying, basically, you suck. <laughs> you work in a place that's killing our kids and you suck. The reason it's so important and I wanted to talk about that is because I think if you're an environmentalist and you're coming into a community, you might not know what the person is dealing with. Part of why I wanted to talk about myself is because I think if you understand the only way out of violence, of sexual abuse, whatever's going on in poverty in their home, is the job that you just said was shitty. I know that if you work in a coal factory, you know they pollute. I know that if you live like we did next to Sheldon Oil, you know that the stuff in the water isn't good for the water. What you don't know is what's the strategy to get your own self and community out of it that isn't taking away the employment center in the community. So part of when I first met environmentalists, they came in the community and they said these jobs were really awful. I hated them. And the reason was they were all rich white people who came in SUVs who said the environment ought to not be bad, so we should stop going to work so they could have clean parks for their kids. I was like, yeah, that equation doesn't actually work really good for us. The reason wasn't just because of jobs, but what was interesting to me is these environmentalists, they never talked about the air for our community. It was like, oh no, it's gonna shift. And so I thought, that just doesn't seem right. So I decided I would hate environmentalists for the rest of my life, <laughs> and, which I did really well for a long time. I would never join the Sierra Club, and I would join the labor movement and beat the environmental movement. <laughs> then I had nieces. And the thing about having nieces when you have a sister that's an addict and their dad is a drug dealer is that you have to start thinking about the world differently. What I realized is it's actually really messed up that some kids think they only get one choice. And I grew up thinking my only choice was a good job but all these other kids grew up thinking in these other families that they could have clean air and good jobs. And I thought, we ought to create a way for these kids, for my girls, to get to choose both. The political got personal. And Phaedra Ellis Lampkins knew that in terms of a clean environment and good jobs, it had to be both and, not either or. 
she joined Green for All. She helped lead Green for All to several groundbreaking policy victories at the federal, state, and local levels, launching state-level green jobs and energy-efficient programs as pathways out of poverty for underserved communities. And now as a mother, she embodies the fierce determination that we can't allow our differences to overshadow our common humanity and endanger our one and only common home. We have to figure out how to relate to one another in a way that lifts each other up. It, you know, it can't, it can't be the environmental movement versus the labor movement versus the women's movement versus the like whoever else's movement because I don't know about your movement, but you may be having huge gains that the environmental movement isn't right now. You may not have been experiencing a Congress that has decided if you are black, brown, woman, poor, or anything else, you should move to Canada. <laughs> it is, and you might not realize that in this moment, to be a person of color when youth are being criminalized, when to be poor has been told by the federal government, when Congress stands up and says, you don't, shouldn't have food stamps, healthcare benefits, why should we pay Head Start? But shoot, we better make sure the economy recovers, but who cares about those kids who need preschool? It's like that that is the debate that's happening is shocking. Because if we aspire to be a movement for real change, we have to acknowledge the shame we carry. And more than the shame we carry, we have to see it in other people. So when we relate to them and change, we don't diminish who they are. The first time I came to a place like this and people were drumming and dancing in the streets, I was quite frankly a little shocked. And <laughs> And what I have to tell you is what we're still working on is feeling like we deserve that freedom, is that freedom to do that. It's like, I saw people, and what happens is you realize there is an incredible luxury of being able to hold yourself and feel as though the world will respond appropriately. And what I want for my daughter I want her to move and dance. I want her to feel like the world will respond because she deserves to dance and that the world will open up and respect that she deserves both healthy jobs and a clean environment and so much more. And I, I know we can't have that if I can't acknowledge who I am. And so my prayer for my daughter and my prayer of gratitude and hope for you is that you'll remember that people like me need people like you, and if it doesn't make sense at first, it's just because we're trying to figure out how to be there, and that any movement that doesn't acknowledge the dignity of any human being is not okay. And we have a responsibility. <laughs> and so, um, I am going to end, but I'm going to dance off the stage. Again, Danny Glover. It's not just one movement in itself. It's a collective memory of all those movements as we move forward, because they've all added value to who we are. They've all added value to our vision of a different world a world that works for all of us. In doing so, everything that we do is we re-inhabit or we reimagine our relationship to the common space, and reimagine our relationship to nature, reimagine our relationship to the things that are important. But it's gonna take that courage. It's gonna take us stepping out, not just where the system itself allows us to step out, but beyond where the system allows us to step out, to fulfill to fulfill that destiny. As Paul Robeson once said, that each generation defines its own history and will be defined at this moment by the history that we make and the way that we take the crisis that we have, a crisis that tests us all, 
but it also provides us with strength. And I think the clarity and the space to reimagine every single thing that happens in our lives, every single relationship is with that, with that, that we move forward in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Danny Glover and Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, making history by remembering the future, reimagining how to live on Earth and with each other. Real change, the political gets personal. You can see Danny Glover's and Phaedra Ellis Lampkin's complete talks. Explore more Bioneers radio shows and video programming online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Distribution is by WFMT Radio Network. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Ryko Disc label. Additional music was made available by James Asher at newearthrecords.com. For more music information, please visit radio.bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0214.